The iSimple PXDP iPod to car peripheral is one of those products that sounds almost too good to be true. When you tell people that there's a way to play their own music library on their vehicle's radio without burning audio CDs, without using a cassette adapter, and without having to resort to an auxiliary input and a mobile device's headphone jack, they tend to be skeptical because your claim is the automotive and audiological equivalent of the fountain of youth. They become even more bewildered if you say that not only can it be done with the factory stock head unit, but that the wiring required to make it happen may very well already be pre-installed, and that there is no hacking a part of the dash required, just a $25 to $40 white plastic box, and a promise of integrated magic. In case you didn't catch it earlier, the product is the iSimple PXDP iPod to car peripheral, and it aims to put your audio library at your fingertips through the vehicle's stock head unit. The way in which it does so is by pretending to be the CD changer, an option that was available to many vehicles in the late 20th century and early 2000s, but rarely actually implemented. Still, many car radios are set up to support it, and some vehicles, like my Buick Park Avenue, are even pre-wired for it, even though the car was never equipped with one in the first place. Now, before you get ahead of me and assume that you don't need the interface box and that you'll just splice into the wiring harness and add your own audio input, I need to stop you right there because it doesn't work that way. The changer communicates with the head unit on a serial data connection, which is implemented differently from manufacturer to manufacturer, and the box must be present because only it knows how to send the hey, I'm the CD changer and I'm plugged in, signal to the radio. The beauty of this system is that it allows for two-way communication, originally so that the radio could tell the CD changer to play, pause, or skip to another track, but especially useful here as well because the device you'll be plugging in to the PXDP is an iPod. And whether you find yourself loving Apple, hating them, or somewhere in between, you've got to hand it to them for standardizing the so-called 30-pin dock connector, which provides not only line-level audio output from the iPod, which bypasses the headphone amplifier, but also a way to feed in external remote controls. What does it all mean? Ideally, it lets you control the iPod from the head unit without having to ever actually touch the iPod. The iSimple takes the control signals and converts them into a format that the iPod will understand and in turn takes the unadulterated, clean, line-level music from the dot connector directly to the radio and gives you quality audio with no fuss and dead simple operation, all in a package that is unbeatably simple to install. Now, earlier I mentioned that this product sounded too good to be true, and while I was blown away by how plug-and-play everything was, the installation wasn't without its snags. First off, if you haven't learned this already, there is a steep financial price to pay for anything automotive-related and anything iPod-related. And unfortunately, this type of product winds up under both categories. While the buy-in is deceptively cheap, you do need to purchase the appropriate harness for your vehicle. Most GMs from this era typically require the PXH GM2, which runs a little less than $9 depending on where you buy it from, but other cables are probably going to cost around the same amount. If your radio doesn't have the changer plug as a separate connection, you better hope that the cable is hidden in the trunk somewhere, because if it's not, splitters can be almost impossible to find for any price. Anyway, after you've spent your $35 or so, you do need to find yourself an iPod. If you've been putting it off until now because of how ludicrously expensive even the crummiest models are, you're going to have to bite the bullet and find one. It doesn't matter how old or new it is, it just has to have the 30-pin connector on it, which means you can use pretty much any model that isn't first generation, second generation, or a shuffle. Also, if you want to actually put music on the thing, that can be a bit of a pain in the ass too because iPods require a very special file and folder layout which can only be accomplished with the ever annoying Tunes software or a program that can emulate its functionality like Media Monkey. Keep in mind that Media Monkey only works with non-iOS devices so you can't just find some old beat up iPhone or iPod touch and use that. More on this later. As a side note, 
there is an unofficial device you can build that works with Android phones and emulates the iPod remote control data, but there is a lot of soldering involved and I don't remember if it would actually give you audio output anyway. If you're a real stick in the mud when it comes to Apple devices and are feeling really adventurous and are reasonably skilled at soldering, this may be an option, but I can't say that I'd recommend it. Anyway, once you've finally rounded up the box and the wiring harness and finagled some songs onto your expensive iPod, you can finally head on over to wherever it is that your CD changer connector is and get cracking. In some Cadillacs, it is conveniently located in the center console, but most of the time, as is the case in the Park Avenue, it's in the trunk, on the passenger side and hidden away down behind the carpet. To get to it, you don't even need any tools because the only screw holding the carpet in place is one of the trunk net anchors. After carefully pulling the carpet downward and out of the way of some of the sharp edges further in, the changer harness will become visible. If the vehicle was never equipped with the changer, the cable will be bound up and taped to the bottom, so you may have to do some minor deep trunk excavation in order to find it. After doing so, set the dip switches on the module according to the requirements of the vehicle as described in the instructions manual and plug it in. the iPod should start charging, and that'll serve as a pretty good indication that the thing is now getting power. If this is not the case, there may be some trouble with the wiring. In my vehicle, there was, for some reason, a bad ground preventing it from working, so I had to splice into my connector and clip onto a chassis ground, but for 99% of installations, this should be totally plug and play, no splicing required. My issue was just a fluke, so just kind of ignore that extra wire sticking out there. If the iPod is getting power, then this is the moment of truth. Turn on the stereo and try switching to the changer. If everything worked right, the head unit should have already sent the play command to the iSymbol, which in turn should have translated it for the iPod. If you don't hear it playing, try switching to the radio and then waiting a moment before switching back to the changer again, as the play command doesn't always get sent to the iPod the first time for some reason. Once you've verified that everything works and sounds good, it's time to shut it all off and head back to the trunk to mount the device. This will vary by vehicle, but in the trunk of the park, there's a handy brace close to where the connector emerges, so I'll be using zip ties to secure the eye symbol to it. The brace, that is. I've stuck some masking tape on temporarily to hold it up while I prepare and attach the zip ties, which may or may not be helpful depending on the application. In this case, I didn't realize until after attaching the first one that there was some opportunity for slippage, so I ended up adding a second tie on top of the trunk carpet screw threading thing. After getting these tight, I ran the iPod cord up above the module and over the carpet. After checking my work a final time and making sure that everything's secure, it was simply a matter of putting the carpet back how it was, and at this point, the bulk of the project is done. From here, it's just a matter of mounting the iPod or hiding it away somewhere. Ideally, I'd like to find some kind of sturdy magnetic holder that could stick to the top of the inside of the trunk and hold the iPod facing downward. This would allow the iPod to be invisible, but also accessible at the same time. Unfortunately, no such product has emerged as of yet, so I'm going to take the simpler approach of just throwing it in the front of the trunk over by the vacuum and tidying up the excess cable with a twist tie. This way, it's still pretty well out of the way, but still secure enough because the vacuum is heavy enough that it isn't going to move around unless I roll that buggy or wreck, in which case we'll have bigger problems than an iPod getting lost in the trunk. For now, while this iPod is being used on a probationary test period, it'll do just fine. Let me know in the comments, though, if you come up with any better ideas, as I wouldn't mind getting that white cable completely out of sight. A couple of points to consider briefly here before I quit. Number one, power consumption. The CD changer power connection in most vehicles is live all the time, even when the car is off, which means that when the iSimple PXDP is connected, it too is always running and recharging the iPod. While this represents an extremely minimal load that isn't likely to kill your battery, I would recommend at least taking your iPod in if you're not going to be driving the car for more than a week or two just to be safe. 
Point number two is potential variations in the process depending on your vehicle. The stock radio in this car is very simple and only has a cluster of seven segment display modules making up its screen and basic playback controls. However, the iSimple is supposed to be able to adapt for use with some better equipped radios to allow for both advanced navigation of the iPod and live feedback on screen of what song is currently playing. As is the case with most anything in life, your mileage may vary, but from what I can tell, this is a near-perfect product with few noteworthy flaws and is by far the best way to play music back in your vehicle with the stock head unit that otherwise lacks connectivity. As I touched on earlier, to get one of these going, it's the cost of the required accessories that actually kills you. The vehicle-specific harness isn't too bad, but just to get a basic, bare-bones, working, 8GB flash-based iPod will set you back at least $30 to $35. If your library is larger than 8Gs, you'll need to cough up even more, so when it's all said and done, be prepared to spend at least $65 to $70 to start from scratch. If you don't mind using the ever-annoying Tunes software, a crusty old 8GB iPhone or iPod Touch can probably be had for a little bit less, and if you already own one, then you're even better off. Anyway though, with all that said, I thank you for joining me for this installation and review, and hope you'll stick around for what's next here on the all-new Channel 2012. Thanks for watching.